Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas. I received my bachelor's in civil engineering from UT Austin, and I'm currently an MBA candidate at Auburn. And now I'd like to introduce our guest for this episode. Jennifer Trout Todaro, SE Lead AP, is a senior engineer for the American Institute of Steel Construction and is a licensed structural engineer in the state of Illinois. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies and Master of Architecture degree with a structural focus, both from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. After graduation, Jenny started her structural engineering career as a consulting design engineer, gathering experience for 11 years on small to mid-rise projects around the U.S. Before joining AISC in 2014, she was a structural associate at the AE firm Harley Ellis Devereaux. She is serving her last term on the Structural Engineers Association of the Illinois Board of Directors and is involved with several committees. Her passions are elegant building design solutions, structural and architectural, and equity in the AEC industry. Now let's jump into our conversation with Jenny. Jenny, welcome to the Structural Engineering Podcast. Thank you for having me. We are really glad to have you on today, and we're excited to have you give our listeners a little bit of a scoop on the AEC industry. Uh, Before we dive into that, I'm curious, will you please share with our audience a little bit about your career journey and what it is you do now on a day-to-day basis at AISC? Sure. Um, I have a little bit of a non-traditional route to structural engineering. I um, have a bachelor's and master's in architecture. I always thought I wanted to be an architect. Um, I do get to still work with buildings, but um, I ended up switching directions when I went to my master's program. I was actually approached right before graduation by the department head in the structures option um, at University of Illinois, and he offered me five dollars if I joined his department. And for some reason, I took him up on it, and now I'm a structural engineer. Um, I actually see him on a regular basis through our, um, our committee work with AISC. So, um, I remind him that he's the reason that I'm an engineer. Um, and, uh, following university, I worked for several engineering firms and then some, um, architectural engineering firms and now work for AISC in their steel solutions center. Um, the steel solutions center focuses on, um, technical and, project assistance for the AEC industry, and I am one of the few people that gets to actually design still at AISC. So I take um, projects in their infancy that are brought into us um, and take a look and see what that would look like in steel and provide information back to architects, general contractors, fabricators, engineers, anybody who's interested in seeing what their project looks like at a conceptual level in steel and actually even bring in uh, some of our member fabricators to help them start budgeting what that might be. So um, that's what I do for AISD now. That's awesome. And I just want to say that $5 is a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty small bribe. So it sounds like the majority of the reason you came is because you had a true passion for structural engineering, right? <laughs> There's a good chance. <laughs> I think that he probably recognized that I was interested. <laughs> and that I was much. maybe, no, no, it was a little, little push in the right direction. That's good. So. We talk a lot about mentorship on this podcast. So that's a great, uh, that's a great reminder that if you're young and someone has said, Hmm, do you think, do you think this is a good fit for you? That's probably a mentor trying to push you, nudge you in the right direction. That's right. Definitely. So, yeah. So it looks like at AISC, you, you kind of get to be in the schematic design phase where you get the overall big picture instead of, instead of taking the design through, but you do get to come up with the ideas to, uh, basically make the building or structure work, right? Correct. I, we use um, RAM structural systems and um, we'll take, typically we'll have some, maybe some architectural drawings, um, some sketches, and we'll design the building in the three-dimensional space that RAM um, provides and give them sizing and elevations and, and that sort of thing, just to get them off the ground um, and, again, push them in the right direction for steel, see if it's a viable option. Gotcha. Those, I think that's, for me, that's always one of the funner parts, kind of in that schematic design phase where you get to kind of play around with the, 
with the concepts. So that's, that's really cool to hear. Uh, Jenny, you're also a private tutor in topics such as, uh, you know, general structures, lateral forces, and statics and dynamics, uh, and, you know, a lot more topics. So how has this experience teaching uh, or tutoring helped advance your engineering career? Um, well, I sort of started teaching when I was in grad school. Um, part of that $5 was also um, a, <clears throat> the ability to be a teaching assistant. And I don't think I actually really understood concepts like moment inertia and that sort of thing until I had to teach it to somebody else. And so I've always found the teaching part um, to be incredibly valuable when it comes to technical, um, but also the people that you get to meet. Um, the, the tutoring I was doing, um, and I don't do as much of it now, and I've kind of changed the direction of what, how I teach and where I teach um, as I've grown in my career, but um, the tutoring was for architects to take their structures exams, and coming from an architecture background, um, it seemed to be helpful for them to look at structures from an architect's perspective as opposed to the way I think a lot of engineering programs look at it, which is a beam in a building. And the way that they approach that exam is, is, is more from the architect's perspective, architect's perspective but um, sometimes it's challenging for them to wrap their head around the number part of it. And, um, and there's a lot of success that I got to see with people having trouble passing it and then working with me um, and then passing, which was you know, kind of exciting um, for somebody who felt like they couldn't, they, this was the one exam that was holding them back to then get licensed because of it. It's really exciting. Um, I, I, like, and I, like I said, the, the people part, um, I got to work with people throughout um, the Chicago architecture community, which really kind of unintentionally set up a network um, of architects that I am able to um, kind of reach out to for one reason or another. Um, and, and I find that really rewarding. I love that. I really, I appreciate that you bring both the human and the technical aspect of that. Uh, it's, it's so critical to have connections and have a community and, and not only for your own advancement within the, the, um, the industry, but also just to have a sense of belongingness and, and feel like you're a part of something bigger than just you and your technical skills. I think that's really important. So I appreciate that you brought that to us. Yeah. It was um, like, uh, I just thought it was cool how it's, you know, you're making yourself better, but you're also building a network in the professional industry too. So that's, uh, I never thought of it that way. So that's really great. Yeah. Yeah. I ended, I ended up being asked to do a little session for the AIA Young Architects group. Um, I was involved with them early on in my career, not realizing that there was a structural engineering version. So I was still stuck in that whole <laughs> architect mindset, even though I'd gone through an engineering program and working as an engineer. Um, and somebody at one of those events turned to me and was like, wait a minute, you, you, could, you could teach us for free. If we, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think about that? And I was like, um, I, I, well, we could, we could try it. I mean, I've been a TA, so I have some teaching experience and um, I ended up doing a session for them. And then somebody came up to me at the end and said, I'd really like to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. And then that's how that whole tutoring thing started. It wasn't, it was, it was very organic. It was, and then if I wanted to get some more students, um, I would actually just do another session. So it was like an hour and a half of my time and I get to meet more people. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and, and now more recently, I actually taught at Northwestern. Um, which was really fun too. It was a different, definitely a different environment. It was more like that TA environment, but without a lead professor. So um, again, I, I, I love teaching. It's just a lot of fun. That is awesome. And I, I had to, so I'm curious, you have been in this like organic informal uh, tutoring situation where it's maybe one-on-one -on -one or it's, you know, more personal. And you've also been in this TA and, and uh, I would say probably an associate or affiliate professor. Um, I think they call them adjunct. Adjunct. Perfect. Thank you. I knew it started today. I couldn't think of what it was. I think, uh, and I don't think I'm a professor. I think I'm a lecturer. I think I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we still, terms. we still think it's incredible. It's more than we've, I've I, never I just, been a professor or lecturer. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to claim anything because those titles mean something. My mom's actually a professor. And so I think that she'd be happy if I 
were very clear in my title. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. We, we appreciate the precision. Uh, so my question is, you've been in these two different sides and you have this passion for teaching. Do you, do you find one feels more comfortable? Do you find one stretches you more? Um, do you get more out of one versus the other? Are there pros or cons? I, I'm really curious to know how you feel about that because I, I also enjoy teaching, um, but mine's always been very informal. And so I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, I, I definitely, my comfort zone is smaller groups. Um, so the one-on-one -on -one is really fun for me. It's not, it's, it's hard in, in the sense that sometimes you have to explain something in like four different ways for someone else to understand it. Um, and that's, but that's fun for me. Larger groups, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of large public speaking. And it does stretch me in that way that I have to kind of think about um, how I can try to accommodate everybody's understanding and, um, and answer questions. Answering questions is almost like one-on-one, -on -one, even if I'm in front of a group, though, because then I can kind of direct, directly solve someone's um, concern. But um, I definitely enjoy the tutoring more. Um, but the large group was presented, and I, and I was at the time actually looking to kind of bolster my public speaking abilities. So um, it really, it, that, that part helped. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I'll, I'll make a pivot really quick and, uh, and start to learn a little bit about some of the, um, the work that you do currently. So I understand that you work in, uh, in a large team and that this can often lead to many different challenges, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you get to face in the office environment that you work in and what it is that you do to overcome those challenges? Sure. Um, I, I definitely think that large groups, like I said, my comfort zone is smaller, so I do what I can to break it down. Because um, I, I work in a, I, even though my company is close to 100, and we have this network of members that we um, reach out to on a regular basis, um, but breaking it down into those smaller work groups really seems to help me. I work in a team of three in the Solution Center but we're inside of the engineering department, which is then, you know, wrapped in AISC. And then we work a lot with our committees, which is all volunteer. And I think for me, breaking the problems down into smaller problems and breaking the, the groups down into smaller work groups, we all get to know each other better. And I think we work together better. Um, but that the fact that we're working with that many people, there, there's always more opinions. Um, more stakeholders, more personal agendas. And so um, I was lucky enough to do um, a, a leadership training um, a couple of years ago that really helped me kind of reframe how to work with others. Um, I'm still definitely working on how to actually implement that because it, it's a mindset and you're constantly working on that mindset. But um, understanding that where people are coming from and meet them where they're at, as opposed to assuming that people are just going to meet you where, where you're at is, um, is a, a lot more effective in uh, moving something forward. So um, I think that's one of the challenges. Um, many of the several challenges working large group. Um, I think another one that we, that we're even more challenged with now that we're not physically in an office together is the, um, is communication um, and, and making sure that we're keeping people updated um, specifically. And then, how we communicate and making sure that that is coming across in a way that is respectful and but still getting the job done. I have a tendency to be direct and I don't mean to be impolite, but I'm an engineer. So I have a tendency to just say like, this is what I need. And then like send. And that's not the way that most people respond, especially I feel like AISD when I started working there, I couldn't believe how um, it's, it's a different work environment than consulting. For sure, because um, consulting is, I feel like I would you know, always inevitably getting a phone call from a contractor. I have the concrete truck here right now. I am pouring right now. You need to solve this problem that has just arisen. We didn't notice until we had the truck. And I'm like, okay, of course, like, you know, how much of that is true? But it's always this go, go, go. I need the answer right now. And you're always kind of on a fire drill, backpedaling sort of um, feeling. But with AISC, because we're creating, you know, the manual and the specification, code standard practice, and a lot of these documents that lead, um, uh, you know, our, our industry, um, 
it's a lot, it has to be a lot more thoughtful. Um, we want to get it right. And so people are a little bit less stressed um, because it's not, we, we, we are able to plan. There's not as much, this sort of thing just happens. We got to figure it out. Like that happens, that happens in every job, but it's, there's more planning um, allowed for in this kind of work. So um, people are less stressed and I would venture to say like appear happier. So then because they're already in a good mood, like I have to think about like, okay, they're, they're, they're not in the go, go, go. I have to, like, I'm always, I'm still kind of in that, even though six years later, that was definitely a transition when I first started. I was like, there's no timesheet. What do I do <laughs> with a timesheet? Um, <clears throat> we used to even just, we just like check a box at the door saying like we've arrived. So they make sure that we, you know, checked in that day. But um, now we don't have an even, we don't have that. Even before COVID, we didn't, we stopped um, kind of reporting our um, attendance essentially. Um, so that's a definitely um, a different mindset and, and realizing that we have a little bit of time to put in that extra, you know, smiley face and, and that sort of thing, so. Yeah, I, I could definitely relate to that as a, you know, consulting. So I definitely see, <laughs> so I was laughing. It's like, yeah, I get it. I think all consultants do, you know, <laughs> it's a high pace when, especially when construction's going. Yes. And I'm curious too, so you, who are the types of uh, people that you work with? You mentioned owners, engineers, obviously, but do you also work with the contractors, trades, tradespeople, et cetera? Like what's the, the range of people that you work with? Yeah, so I didn't really understand who AISC was, honestly, before I started interviewing with them. To me, AISC was the manual, and that's what they produced. Like, they probably also did a bunch of other stuff, but to me, as an engineer, they were the producer of, like, the standards that I used for steel. Um, well, it turns out it's not just the standards. Um, they don't, um, they also work with certification, which I also kind of peripherally understood which is the um an increased uh, increased quality control system for the fabrication of steel so you have the, you know all the steel manufacturers in the united states are held to a certain standard by um our our documentation at aisc but if they choose to they can also become certified which um, there's a lot of other benefits that come along with that for the certified person, the certified company, but also the people who hire them. So you might be able to avoid certain inspections because they've already promised a certain level of quality um, on, in the shop and on site. So um, there's a the whole group that administrates our certification um, audits and, and that. We also have um, a group, I originally was in actually market development and I've moved more into engineering now, but um, we have a market development group that is out there to be the face of steel for anybody who needs that one-on-one. -on -one. So we, they very much um, emphasize that um, that face-to-face, -face, you, you know, have a face to talk to. If you have a question, you know who you can call. You can call your local um, specialist um, or you can call the solution center. Um, and we have people who work on our conference. So there are, none of those people are technical. They're all super patient with us engineers because we have a certain personality type and uh, they're all about making the best experience for everybody, which is great because if we had engineers doing that, I don't think we'd have as good of a time at our conference. And um, so we have, we probably have, and then this is just a guess, it's not, for sure not the actual numbers, but I feel like we're half administrative and half engineers. Um, so we have engineers in every department. We'll have engineers in the marketing department. Uh, we have engineers obviously in engineering. Um, we have engineers in our certification department. We have it, engineers in our education group who provides education, continuing education for practicing engineers, but we also have a group that reaches out to university level. Um, students and professors and supports them. So, um, so that's a very long answer to your question about who I work with. But <laughs> it's, 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 it's a different balance than a consulting firm because we have a lot of administrative staff that support um, the work that we do. It's also a very 
it's a varied group. I mean, you've got so many different backgrounds. I, you, you were mentioning all these roles and I was like clicking check, check, check as far as all the different people that I get to work with at Hilti. Um, I've, I've been on the engineering in uh, continuing education standpoint. That was the last role that I did was delivering, you know, education for, for structural engineers. So I, I understand what that group goes through. I'm, I'm currently an engineer in marketing and it is, um, I, I work with uh, engineers who are in your position where they're an engineer in marketing, but they're doing engineering work. You're actually designing things. You're actually, uh, you know, helping, helping individual project work. So it's, I actually am a little bit surprised how similar Hilti and, and AISC are, but I, I, it is a huge machine. And when you're, I, I know that I speak to people all the time and I say, oh, I work at Hilti. Or, you know, if you, if you say I work at AISC, they say, okay, great. You produce and they're used to that book, that technical manual. Oh yeah, you ha- you're the one who creates the product tech guides that I use that are on my desk. Or I yeah, you create the steel bible. Yeah, um, it's so it's so funny to to kind of open um, people's eyes to all the different aspects that make these large groups that are providing more than just technical data available to you. And it's it's funny because I think, and Matt, actually, I would appreciate your insight here. You know, if 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 you share all these different aspects of what your company does um, as a larger um, uh, industry, multidisciplinary manufacturer or, or industry organization um, to the consulting engineer, if I mentioned all those things, you'd probably go, oh yeah, I've, I've heard of that, but it's hard to get out of the idea of, well, I rely on you for technical information. Yeah, exactly. It's um, yeah. kind of what Jenny was saying too, is, you know, I've pretty much been working in the consulting industry and, uh, yeah, AI, AISC, I think of the, the Steel Bible. So it's, it's, it's for, for me, it's really interesting to see, because I know it's a big organization. It's like, what else do they do? <laughs> and there's yeah. so many resources out there. So it's really cool to see that, um, you know, firms such as, as AISC, they're really like multifaceted in terms of what they provide. And, and it's not just for the engineers, but they do so much in terms of, you know, you do need to talk to different types of, uh, of people. So yeah, for me, that's, that's why, I, that's why I'm always curious about that. It's like, I know you guys do this, but what else do you do? And then when the doors open, it's like, Oh, that's, that's a lot of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, and NASCC yeah. has tracks for erectors and contractors and fabricators yes. and installers. They yeah. have a pretty wide range of people that you guys interact with. Yeah. I was going to like, realized at the end of what I was saying that I had not really addressed the outside people. Um, yeah, so um, we have our little, our little, you know, AISC planet and then, um, but we're really there to serve the industry and the industry is, like we, we serve it from the mill, you know, out to the end user. So um, our members, we have different kinds of memberships, which is one of the things I did not understand before, but um, AISC is highly funded by the people who make steel. So you get a manual because the fabricators and mills want you to be able to design with their product, if that makes sense. So AISC is one of our functions is to help facilitate that. So um, when we, I, I thought that AISC wrote the manual, for instance. Well, we don't. Our, we have actually, we just kind of guide it and make sure it happens. But we have large, huge groups of um, volunteers from the industry that, are, again, are from that mill, fabricator, erectors, um, design engineers, uh, educators, researchers, all these people all come together on a, um, depending on which committee it is, mostly at least twice a year, usually more often than that, to look at our documents and make sure that they're current uh, with new research or just make sure that they are saying what they need to say. And in some cases, actually, we have people, even this week, I got an, e- we got an email that said, I think there's a conflict between what's being said in the specification and what's being said in your commentary. Like, is that, am I reading that right? And they were right. So we're giving that to the committee that, was look, that kind of shepherds that part of, our, um, of the documents, and they're going to review it and figure out how to change the language to make it more, um, more legible, more uh, understandable for um, the end users. So um, in, in the role that I do with the design work, I do get to work with the owners, the architects, the engineers, the fabricators sometimes will come in and say, I've been asked to take a look at this project. It's actually drawn in concrete. And I 
been asked to give a budget on a concrete project that they wanted to go steal. And I'd like it to go steal. What does that look like? And so that's one of the things where I take that and I design it and steal. So they have a more educated um, budget number so that they might actually be able to flip it to the right material in that, you know, in that case. So um, the way we work with each of those different groups is, is interesting too, because, you know, some of those fabricators don't even realize we offer this kind of service where we can do a, con a complimentary conceptual solution for them. And I'll meet them in the committee environment and they'll ask what I do and I tell them and they're like, wait, you guys do that? And it's like the best kept secret because you know I've been doing it for six years, but it's been going on for significantly longer. Um, and we just, we want to get that the steel idea on the market. So um, we're, we're interested in talking to anybody and everybody um, about, about, you know, seeing what steel looks like in their projects and, and how it can function better for them. So. I love that. I, I want to give a quick plug to our audience really quick. So um, I know in some of our more recent episodes, if you've listened to those, um, we've talked a lot about, you know, how do you utilize a little bit of business knowledge to make yourself better in your career? How do you, how, you know, what is an opportunity um, mixing structural engineering with with computer programming work like um, if you're an if you're an engineer young or tenured who is very interested in always being technical you don't necessarily want to go into business um, we, as we mentioned there are some things you can take from other aspects of, of work to make yourself better but being involved in these committees that Jenny just mentioned is such an amazing opportunity you really get to see how the entire machine works um, and how these codes and these, you know, this, these provisions are developed. Um, this, I, I, I'm not trying to disparage um, AISC, but if you are designing in concrete audience members, AISC, or I'm sorry, <laughs> ACI, the American Concrete Institute, has a very similar setup where there are committees that develop these provisions and they continuously need to make sure that mm -hmm. they are in tune with the market and with the industry um, and with the available technology that we have. So if you are passionate about a specific part of the code, which sounds super nerdy, but we all know that we have a section that we really like or a chapter, it's cool. So we're all friends here. Um, if there's something you're really passionate about from a technical aspect, even if you are very young and even if you don't have your PE license, those committees will eventually need new members and they would love to have you listen in and shadow and see how the process works so that by the time you do have your PE, by the time you do have some, some tenure under your belt, you can contribute to those committees. So if you have any interest in going in that direction, you should absolutely be reaching out to ACI or AISC and they can they can get you into the right or uh, committee mm -hmm. to where you can start learning and then eventually be able to contribute to that committee as a committee member or even lead the committee um, later in your career. So if technical is the way you know you want to go, great way to develop your technical network um, and contribute back to the, to the industry. Yeah, thank you for saying that because that's actually one of the pushes that we've recently been um, addressing because um, as uh, I've worked as a secretary on those committees, which uh, that's who the AISD staff person is um, when we're, we're interfacing with that group, we're, we're the secretary. So we're making sure that all the notes are being taken and being brought back um, to AISD to integrate into any new documentation. But as the, that staff person seeing our committee group, um, we often, and this happens in every committee, it's not AISD, it's, it's any, and it's in business, we, ask people to join who look like us. So when we're thinking of who we, if we even think of it, which is also the thing we'd like to push, you know, people who are already involved, where's that junior person that you could bring with you? Because we have room for guests. We, we, have, a, we have a setup to allow for that. Um, so you're not gonna be able to vote, um, but you probably don't wanna vote yet anyways. I mean, when, I, when you sit in there, you're like, oh my gosh, these people know so much more than me. Like, I mean, as a secretary, I was like, I don't think I should be doing this. This is, they're, they've been working on this, these, these items forever. Like they, they, know, they know the material of steel back and forth and I'll never understand how much they understand. They have PhDs in it. So, um, but being there and, um, and just kind of breathing it in and, and understanding how that all works. And then they all get together at lunch and they're all buddy, buddy. And then they'll go back to these super technical discussions. And if you, I, I didn't know that even existed before working at AISC. Um, I, like I said before, I've been very involved with other professional organizations, but they're not 
necessarily technical based. They're almost more networking, let's have a good time and also learn something. Um, but uh, that, that idea of, of asking questions and, and hopefully there's somebody at your company that's involved already because it's good to have that, that a mentor to bring you in because then they can kind of sit there and say, this is what we're talking about right now. This has been in the discussion since whenever, you know, and uh, a very big one is the ASD versus LRFD and whether that belongs, where those belong, right? So that came up in the last, uh, one of the last um, committee meetings I was at, which was like a couple of committee meetings back, but like this was a big deal. And I was, my first deal manual was LRFD strictly only LRFD. And so I didn't realize this huge like schism essentially until I started working and then they said, well, we're not going to look at your work unless it's ASD. And so then I <laughs> had to go do ASD anyways. But, um, but I, I encourage anybody and everybody who is interested in, like you said, it doesn't have to be steel. It could be concrete. It could be just code work. So ASCE, um, any of these groups, they're going to need a younger set of people to join. Um, and I mean, not going to, we need it now. But um, because that diverse perspective and the, and the question asking really gets us to a better spot. So I, I'm glad you mentioned it because that's actually something that um, me and a few other people at AISC kind of brought up is like, we really need to make this happen. We need to make space on our committees to bring in those younger people. And so this last round actually was a big, um, uh, we, we made a lot of people emeritus, which keeps all of that knowledge, but creates space for those new people. And um, on the committee that I was on specifically, I was super excited. Um, I, if, if there were competition for um, gender diversity, my mine got mine won because awesome. we brought three, awesome. three women, three women onto ours that I was like, and I didn't have a whole lot to do with it, but I was like, if it was a competition, I won. That's um, fantastic. So I just wanted yeah, to chime I, in there too, because yeah. it was a, I think you made some great points about, you know, you were saying, they have PhDs and people that know a lot, which is great. Uh, but then you have engineers complaining about, hey, I can't read the code or why is this thing so confusing? Well, you weren't there to, to help it, you know, to get that yeah. other perspective because yeah, these PhDs know, they obviously know a lot. Um, and you know, to them, it's kind of just like, an, they're fluent in another language almost, a technical language. A hundred percent. Mm -hmm. But from a designer perspective or from any other perspective, it's kind of like, it's good that you don't know it because now you can kind of get that perspective of, hey, why is this so confusing? Is this what you guys mean? Then, you know, you can have your two cents, especially if you're, you know, like a consultant or, or in another position, it can, they can use that perspective too. Uh, and Jenny, I just wanted to backtrack because I uh, mm -hmm. wanted to get this question out there. Could you talk about some of the challenges in the in the trades? Sure. Um, so something that also has kind of come up because I've worked for AISD, something that I probably wouldn't have had access to before um, was to actually hear from the fabricators. Um, and, and then beyond that is women in the trades, um, minorities in the trades, which is, it's all very interesting to like really get hammered home because for me anyways, the, um, and you've probably seen articles here and there about the trades, the skilled trade shortage that we're in and what they're, they're forecasting is like, is crazy. Um, that we'll, we'll be needing so many people, the average age of our current skilled trades people are in their 50s. That's the number is like 55 or something. Um, and like, what, how is that sustainable? You know, and, and like I said before, even with the committee work, I said, you know, we hire people who look like us. Well, the trades have been trying to hire people who look like them and they're not interested anymore. Um, but they're really well paid jobs. They're secure um, and uh, they're skilled. So they're, they're really, they're well paid. And so there's been a huge push um, from a lot of different groups um, trying to increase the diversity of the people in the trades um, and, and make those opportunities available to everybody. Uh, I don't know how you guys uh, went were in your high schools, but my high school shop was turned into an area for our, our janitorial staff. It was not some place where you got to work on cars. 
um, or build anything. Um, it was actually prohibited for students to get over there, right? So our high schools have made it impossible to get that kind of training in a regular high school environment like it used to. Um, and, and we're seeing the results as it stands now. We have people that are going to college and then they're not getting the job they think they should be getting. They're having these huge debts and they're not able to pay them off because they don't get the job that pays that off. And um, there's so many different avenues for successful careers and the trades is one of those ways that you actually, a lot of the trades, they pay you. They're paid internships. They're, you, you're getting paid through the process of learning and then you come out without debt. So, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, there's a lot of really big conversations going on about this. Um, AWS has been doing um, some really great work, um, the American Welding Society, and um, they, they're really interested in increasing that diversity. And, and they came to speak um, two years ago at NASCC with, with me. I, had a, I held a panel with um, a woman who teaches um, underemployed or unemployed women to weld and then helps them get jobs. Um, so she came and spoke. There was another woman from the West Coast that, um, that runs a welding school on the West Coast. And she's a huge proponent of getting women into the workforce and uh, increasing diversity. They're, they're so interesting to see all these different people and how they're, um, they're really engaging um, that, that need because there's a lot of people that really need better jobs. They feel like they're stuck and they feel like they're, they can't, they don't have something to move forward with that can really be sustainable. And it's, it's really interesting, this kind of world I've opened up. There's a woman named Vicki O'Leary who um, is working with Ironworkers International. She's an iron worker herself. She, um, she's a, an amazing story. Uh, she became an iron worker because her brother was going to go test to become an iron worker. And he told her she couldn't do it. And she said, I bet I could. And she did. Um, That's my kind of girl. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. She's amazing. And she actually received the ENR um, Top Newsmaker Award two years ago now, I think, um, for her work um, getting, she got women, uh, iron workers in the union maternity leave recently, which, you know, when she, I, I called her, then this is that networking thing that I, I, I just can't believe the kind of network that I've been able to reach out to. Someone said, you know, you should talk to this woman. And she picked up the phone and she talked to me for over an hour about all the different work she's doing with Iron Workers International. Um, and um, so she got maternity leave for women, which is huge because actually that's one thing that we need to do better is support women in the trades because it's, you're making decision between working and having a family that like, what year is this? that, you know, what, where are we, um, if we have to make those decisions. And, um, and so it's really cool that Ironworkers has kind of come through with that. And then she's also started a new initiative um, called Be That One Guy. And essentially, there's um, an issue with harassment on the job site. And it's not just against women, and it's not just against minorities. You know, there's, she, the way she describes it, it's a safety issue, and it happens. It, there's always that one guy on the site who just is making things a little bit more difficult than they need to be. We don't need to be rude. We don't need to do those sort of things, but that's how, that's the environment he grew up in the industry and, and he's just continuing it, right? Um, and this um, initiative that she created is a training to help people feel empowered to just say, knock it off. You know, just, that's not, we, we don't want that here. It's not something we want to we want to have on our site. We're all in this together. We're working on a team, and that attitude isn't appropriate. Um, but if they can say it at the time, just knock it off. Then all of a sudden, this person, these, and she calls them like the one bad apple. She's like, we are a family here at Iron Workers, and that's it's really interesting. If you look her up and see her talk, she talks about how everyone is incredibly supportive, and there's just sometimes that one person on site who's making it difficult for others and that then that can be the person that that makes somebody quit because they just don't want to deal with it anymore and so um that's this is this kind of world that i i wasn't really um privy to as a consulting engineer because i i was so far removed from 
the, the people actually building. Um, you know, I work with GCs all the time. I go on site, but how often would I sit there and talk to the person that's actually welding? Never. Um, so that's something that's been really um, of interest to me, and I've been trying to keep it um, uh, in, our, in our conference, something we're always talking about, um, because the skilled trade shortage and this need for, for new blood, like, we're, we're missing this huge group of people out in the U.S. that um, are ready to take those types of positions um, if we were to remember that they're there. And so um, there's, there's a lot of work going on around that, but I, there oh, can always be more and more exposure is, um, is I, we can just talk about it more. We just keep talking about it and talking I love about it. it. And I love I try it. to bring it back. It's fantastic. Well, I, and I, I agree with your, your, uh, root cause analysis that says that this, a lot of this stems from our high school systems and the fact that the U.S. for so long has said we are a services uh, industry, we are a services, a nation of services, so we go into college formats and whether or not students are ready for that, whether or not they have the desire to or even the, the learning style that really matches our university system, we, we do a great disservice to our students. And one of the biggest disservices, like you mentioned, is we don't do a good job of explaining what the full breadth of options are and then the financial gain and cost of doing those. A university degree versus getting paid internship from being in a, a plumber or a mechanic or you know in any kind of position where you're in a trade that are incredibly lucrative and get you started in building your own personal wealth at 18 years old. Uh, my, my brother-in-law is actually considering that right now. And I, he's not, he's, you know, 21 and I'm like, yes, please go do that. That's such a great opportunity. Um, but I, I actually, I got chills when you mentioned Vicky's name. Uh, Vicky was one of the starters of hard hatted woman. Have you heard? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you start talking about the trades and welding and all of the different um, all the different issues that women face in the trades on the job site. And you mentioned a couple. I mean, maternity leave is leaps and bounds from where we were. But even today, there are job sites where there aren't restroom facilities that are fully closed or enclosed or covered. And you know, women will not use that on a job site full of guys. And there's it's it's fascinating. I could also dive into this conversation because I I'm I'm. <laughs> I'm, re I'm invigorated by the renaissance that the trades are having, but it is not an inclusive or safe place for women, which means it's not an inclusive and safe place for everyone. And when we make things better to, inc to incorporate the entire workforce that we could be bringing into the trades and having skilled labor, we, we really do raise the standard and the level of safety for everybody on the job site. So I am super passionate about this. Um, I believe that Hard Headed Woman comes out in 2021. It's supposed to premiere at Sundance then. Um, so listeners, keep tabs on that. It is a fantastically interesting documentary on women in the trades. And iron workers are a large portion of who they spend focus on. So if you're a steel engineer, um, this, this could be a very interesting topic for you. I'm, I'm like, I could dive into that for hours. <laughs> I just think it's fascinating. Um, yeah. I, yeah. So I think you may have, have answered my, my next question, which would have been, um, what are some emerging initiatives that you're seeing in the AEC industry that have caught your attention? Obviously this is an attention grabber. Anything else that you want to share with us there? Um, well, I just recently, again, this is like through a coworker of mine, um, they had gotten an email that was local to them. So they were, um, they're in North Carolina and there was this group called, um, she built this city and he, you know, he, people think like at AISD, if I have coworkers, they are usually like, Oh, this thing's going on. It's involving women. You should probably, <laughs> cause I'm a little vocal about it at the office. So, um, and actually outside the office, obviously, but um, she, he, he was like, there's things going on. I couldn't attend. So I just sent the organizer an email and I said, I'm so sorry. I couldn't see, I, I didn't get to watch your webinar on what your guys are up to. Um, so it turns out so we had another meeting and she brought in uh, their intern. It's a nonprofit um, that, and the intern is, um, I think she was, she's going into mechanical like um, HVAC. So she's, she's doing, um, and not engineering. She's uh, she's in the um, in the trades. She's starting that process, um, and so that's her. In, that's that's the group's intern, and so she had to sit there and listen to us chat. And I, you know, did what I sort of do with the geeking out on on what we can do and what we should do. And so this group um, was started by a woman in the trades who uh, is you know seeing 
the issues we're seeing and she wants to go earlier than high school. And um, so they are a brand new organization that is focusing on girls and getting tools in girls' hands and having them just understand what they are. Um, and I was actually, I, I was on Facebook the other day and I saw um, there was another, there's another group that's similar. Um, I think it's tools and tiaras possibly. And so there's this group, there's these groups that are going out and they're making sure that girls feel comfortable with tools. And like I grew up and it was funny. Um, my dad actually passed away a couple like last year and my brother's like, I just got to hold the flashlight. And I was not the person that held the flashlight. I got to do all the work. And um, so my dad must have trusted me. <laughs> but um, I saw so I'm like, Oh, you got to hold the flashlight. That's it. You like whatever he did work around the house. You know, I was I was in there. You know, I was in there, you know, using every tool. I know what they are. I know what the names are, all that stuff. Um, and I do home improvement stuff constantly. But um, I was like, this is great, because they're right. You know, if you if the girls are excluded from those kinds of um, if they, even if they, they probably don't get to even hold the flashlight, you know, they don't, they don't get to see um, what's going on with, um, you know, keeping up a house, you know, working on a car, any of those things, those things are all just kind of, those are opportunities that aren't happening. Um, so this group is really focusing on, on young girls. And because of COVID, this, I thought this was amazing, this, because of COVID, they'd had all these summer camps set up, but they're, um, they weren't able to do them. And so they took all the funding that they'd received and bought a, um, an Airstream and outfitted it so they could actually remotely go and have outdoor events and like kind of one session events as opposed to the camps that they were, that had been planning locally. Um, I was like, that's amazing. And they named it POW. Um, and it was like, and it's this big, you know, there's a lot of traction there. And it's like, that's just, it's fun. And it's like the, you know, girls who code kind of idea. Um, but, but for the, for me, physical stuff has always been more interesting. You know, you push like this, why structural engineering is something I like. You push on a wall, it pushes back. That's why it doesn't fall down. Um, and that sort of thing. So, um, so that's been really interesting to hear about. And um, they're also folks, they have, they have two focuses. Their original focus was on the young girls, but they also want to support women um, currently working and so they have a women at work advisory council that um, I'm starting to get involved with um, as one of the structural engineers and I just we just had a meeting last week I think um, where I got to see all these women across the country who are all like CEOs of different you know like of an aluminum manufacturer and then there was a woman like all these people with all these like C suite names and I was like what am I doing here but um, but it's so cool to see everyone getting behind this idea and supporting it. So, um, and sometimes I'm wondering like, well, this should be one effort because then we're, we're too splintered. But at the same time, getting involved locally is really, it's where you start. Um, and this group really wants to go national and they're gonna be working with um, the National Women in Construction group. So they're, they're getting like, they're, they're brand new. So, but they're, they're working on really amazing things um, and, uh, it's just, it's, it's exciting, uh, especially when you're kind of stuck at home and you're like, well, we'll never go back to the office and all that stuff. But um, to see this sort of thing happening is, is exciting and, and being a part of it is even more. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what's so cool about it too is, you know, there is this, especially with the, like you were mentioning with the trades, you know, there is that whole other workforce and obviously mostly male dominated, but once you get these people in it, I think it just really opens up a new door for, for the next generation because, you know, I'm opening up like the, the steel magazine and I see women welders and that's already imprinted in my mind, but think of what it's doing for the next generation. And so I, I just think that's what's so cool about it is because yeah, you are taking away that, um, I don't know, that stereotype or you're making a new stereotype of seeing what, what the industry is. It's not just men, but uh, a whole group of, of women leaders. Um, uh, Jenny, I did want to ask one, my last question is a career related for anyone that wants to, you know, kind of follow in your career path. So you were working in, you know, the consulting industry. 
how did you get into kind of this position? I don't even know what you would call it. Um, Cause right. Cause you're, I guess what would you describe it? If someone wanted to kind of get in your position, maybe work for uh, the AISC industry, would they just, you know, like Google uh, something like where, was it the Solutions Center? Because it, it does seem like a cool career, like uh, what you do. So if someone wanted to go on that career path, how would they get into it? Do they need to get in touch with the, with the organizations or, or do you have any advice for someone that wants to go on that career path? Yeah, I, I think that maybe we could group it as sort of non-traditional engineering roles and um, and Hilti also offers like that. These, there's a lot of companies that um, that that really harness the engineering education that you have, um, you know, in school, but also working. And um, and so looking for non-traditional roles is challenging. Um, I wasn't necessarily looking for this. I was actually, when I, when I moved here to AISD, I also interviewed at more consulting positions and, um, and I was, I had just had my first child and I was trying to kind of, uh, I wanted, I was, I was weighing whether I needed, I wanted to like leave. And it felt like at the time it felt like leaving. Um, it's really not leaving um, at all because I'm actually more connected now than I probably was as a consultant to our industry. But um, that this is uh, this was th th this position came up for me because we were actually in the same building and I was already friends with people at AISC because AISC is a Chicago based company I was already in Chicago um, but I do know that there are um, recruiters that specifically work on non-traditional roles um, there's um, and and I think they actually I've, I've worked with them I've spoken with them before um, in pre at previous times when I was looking to kind of make a change and nothing really came up at the time. But then, um, and so it was funny when I took the job at the ISC, um, Brian Quinn called me and said, so you, you got that job that I was probably going to call you about. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I guess that the answer for kind of keeping an eye open for that, um, if you're, if you think maybe consulting isn't, isn't the where you want to be um, the people who you talk to to support you are also engineers I guess is where that's going so like Hilti for instance um, could be um, Hayward Baker is a, a firm in Chicago that does a lot of deep foundation um, all these different kinds of foundations um, but they have a marketing group that has to be smart about what they're talking about so they can talk to engineers um you know they don't they have it so there's a lot of like company dynamics that i probably didn't understand coming out of school because that wasn't a part of our education um and so i think thinking about the companies that you work with on a regular basis as a consulting engineer and realize that those people also have that engineering background that's why they can talk to you the way they they can they can support you that way um, technically and maybe that might be a different um, a different environment for you um, and and some of them are more uh, remote we have like the marketing staff we have out um, around the country they all work from their cities so we don't we see them well we don't get to see them in person very much anymore with COVID but we typically see them throughout the year um, but they're on their own kind of coming up with their own way to talk about steel. This is just specific to what we work with here. And, and uh, they get to use their engineering expertise to, to support people. And then if they need more help, then they reach back out to us. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question exactly, but um, no, I think there's a lot great. of support roles. Yeah, like I think, I think that out. I didn't realize it at the time. Yeah, I, that's great because it's like sometimes there's opportunities where you, you might not even know it. And, you know, like you said, people that are helping you, they have that technical background too. And, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's great advice. You know, keep a lookout because um, there's, there's those non-traditional roles that are out there, but, you know, you just don't see them as often and they could be right under your nose. So thanks for that. Yeah, I, one more plug. I actually, fabricators often have staff engineers. Oh yeah, which That's you might true. not realize. Yeah, um, some of the bigger companies have really developed um, engineering 
departments because they have to figure out how to build your stuff if your stuff isn't drawn well. <laughs> so <laughs> they're spending a lot of uh, a lot of time um, engineering connections specifically, or sometimes those are um, those are subcontracted subcontracted out. But the larger firms have um, have really sophisticated, like some of those PhDs I was telling telling you about in the committees. Those are people who work for fabricators. So um, it's it, it was a whole different view that I got started when I started working for AISC and, and meeting these people. And it's it's just like it's incredibly impressive to know that that's who's guiding the uh, the industry. I think it's amazing. You've given us such a well-rounded view of what really the, the breadth of of engineering in the steel industry, and I am very very thankful for that. I definitely have my eyes opened, um, and I think you've shared some fantastic insights with us in in a variety of different ways. So thank you so much, Jenny, for coming on the show with us. Where can our listeners connect with you or follow you or hear more of your amazing insights? Um, I think probably the best place is LinkedIn. Um, I'm, Twitter is my professional account, but I'm, I'm not particularly active right now because I don't get to go on job sites and do fun pictures and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the best. Um, yeah. Perfect. I will make sure I'm connecting with you immediately after this, because I, I think you have a lot of interesting, uh, interesting perspective to share. So again, thank you for coming on with us and, uh, and thank you for spending the time to, to educate us all. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and questions to leave them. Please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 37 as well as any of the links to the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you tune into your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.